Welcome into the KSO Show. Mason Voth, Derek Young here with you on uh, this beautiful Wednesday. And that's not a joke. Normally in February, you say it's a beautiful day. You're probably lying, saying it tongue in cheek. Today's supposed to actually be really nice out. So everybody enjoy that and uh, whatever you need to do outside. Today's a good day to get it done. We're here to uh, look at one thing in particular with football today. I'm sure everybody is well aware uh, quarterback is a, a hot topic, not just for K-State football, but really everywhere. That that kind of defines the sport right now and has for probably, I don't know, the last decade plus at this point. I mean, quarterback's always been the most important position, probably at least since they started throwing the ball. Uh, running back probably at one time was was more important. But now it's there's no doubt about it. And for K-State, we have seen over the last four seasons now just how important the quarterback position is because they've had to play a backup quarterback every single year since 2020. 2019, they got through it clean with Skylar Thompson, but then 2020 and 2021, he dealt with injuries. Then obviously you lost Adrian Martinez, you turned to Will Howard. And then last year, it really wasn't because of injury, but you had to go to your backup because of poor play by Will Howard at one point. Now, I don't envision that being the case for this year's team with Avery Johnson at quarterback and saying, oh, this guy doesn't have doesn't have it. We got to go to whoever's behind him. But I'm sure there are people that are thinking, okay, he, he's got the legs, he runs. Those guys put themselves in harm's way a little bit more. Uh, so quarterback depth might be something to consider, even if you don't want to think about it as a K-State fan. Is it going to be a problem this season, though, D.Y.? Because Avery Johnson... He's not even thrown for 500 yards in his career. He's only started one game. And then everybody you have behind him has never taken a snap in a Division I football game. So, I mean, how concerned should people be about it? And yeah, and to your point with Avery Johnson, even if he were to have some hiccups and hurdles, he's going to have a much longer leash just because it is his first year. They realize, you know, the, the inexperience is there. You're going to be patient with him. He's going to have a longer leash than someone like Will Howard um, to an extent. Now, and, and the leash was shorter last year because you had Big 12 championship standard, a Big 12 championship game appearance on the line, and you weren't going to balk from that. Despite every Johnson being the guy, you still kind of do, though. So that'll be an interesting uh, dynamic to kind of weigh against one another. But even I, I think you're going to see growing pains from Avery Johnson. You're not going to bench those growing pains that everyone tends to have at the beginning of their career. Um, if he doesn't and he is just special, then and then hallelujah. But like you said, every, every team, uh, Kansas State, a lot has had to go to the backup quarterback. Um, but every team in the Big 12, it feels like, has had to kind of do that. It's just kind of no longer – I mean, I think back when we started watching college football growing up, I think there was like, what, nine – I mean, I remember when there was nine-game seasons a little bit, or, or at least at the maximum ten. And, and now you're talking about – I mean, Kansas State's played some, game, played some seasons with 13, 14 games – I think the toll of that is why you are seeing some of these injuries take more place. Just because – think about the NFL, right? They added a 17th game. Now I think what they said, at least 23 teams had to play a backup quarterback this past year because they played – so there was only nine that didn't. Um, that's pretty amazing. Or at least didn't have to start one, right? I think if you take away the starting uh, part, then it was like 27 or 28. So – uh, it's just the nature of the beast with football anymore. Uh, TV means more money. More money means you're probably going to have to play more games. More games means you're probably going to have more injury. So yeah. the back of quarterback does pre become pretty significant. Um, to be honest, yeah, I think it's a little bit of a problem for K-State if they get into a situation where they're going to have to start one or two. Now, hopefully, because Jacob Kudnuth has been around college football for a bit, that he's ready and it won't, the moment won't be too big for him, and he's at least sufficient, right? I think that has to be the hope. Or Kellen Samantic, the walk-on from Washburn, just because he has played college football, not a ton because he has been injured and it's been at the Division II level at Washburn. But, you know, he has the wherewithal a little bit, the awareness of what it takes. So maybe one of them is ready enough, sufficient enough, but I don't think you can anticipate that from Blake Barnett since he was always considered raw. He's going to be a true freshman. I don't think he's 
in the vein of Avery Johnson where he's going to be ready or one or should be expected to be. Yeah, and it, I went and looked because you, you bring up you know the NFL's added games. Uh, 32 teams in the NFL, less than a third of quarterbacks in the NFL played in all 17 games last season. And you go through the list, and there are a handful um, that like only two, I think, didn't play because they were held out for a last game of the year. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything because we already know what we're locked into. Purdy, Mahomes, I guess Lamar Jackson would be in that boat as well. But like guys miss time in the NFL. And if you look at the list too and you say, okay, well, like Dak and Tua, they they played all 17 this year. Those are guys that last year missed ample time throughout this. So like it, it is a weird thing and it's something to consider. And you mentioned the four guys on the roster in the depth, and, and people can see it there if you're watching on the YouTube, but it, you lay it out and you just see where the experience lies. I think you make a good point about Jacob Knuth because he's going to be in his third season on a college roster. He's done it with two different programs, so he's probably got a little bit better mindset to handle something if he needs to come in. But like anything, until you actually get out on that field, nobody really knows how it's going to look. And that that's kind of the thought process with when you talk about Avery Johnson and, hey, it, you're still waiting for that learning moment to happen because he's come out and looked really good every time we've seen him. You could maybe say it was the fumble against TC or against Houston, but, you know, I, that that that's not really something to, to look at too hard. So I think it's going to be interesting to see how it works out and, Fortunately enough for K-State, I think that Avery Johnson, while people think of him as a runner, we know that he can throw the ball as well. He wants to be more of a thrower. He wants to show that he can do that, and that probably gives K-State their best chance to win. And I also think this isn't a guy that just you know started running the other day. Like He understands, I think, how to take hits and how to, to, to deal with some of this stuff, and I think that's a big part of it too. Um, certainly different body types and, and position, but like I think of uh, Deuce Vaughn at K-State, I think he's the best football player I've ever seen when it comes to taking hits. He somehow knew, all right, if I take it this way and then I finish this, like I think he he seriously knew how to take hits and that helped him stay healthy. And I think Avery Johnson can be protected in that way, and I think that's also something that he can probably be uh, coached up on or he himself will understand, all right, if I don't put myself in this situation, I'm going to be okay. But I also don't want people thinking that means that he's going to be passive when he runs the football. I think when it's there, he's not going to be afraid to to take some shots, but you just can't be unruly and stupid about how you handle it. And an understanding of where you are on the field. Um, if you're the sideline, use it. If you, and if you see that you're kind of in a position where you're, you're kind of surrounded – just, just go down, slide, do whatever. I, I think those things need to be incorporated a little bit more than probably what they have been in the past. And and I'll be honest, I know they ran with Skylar Thompson and they ran with Adrian Martinez and they even ran with Will Howard. I just don't know that you're going to see, at least from a design run standpoint, like as much with Avery Johnson. I know that seems wild because he's the most dynamic with his legs of them, but he is so – uh, insistent on being a passer and believes that he can be a passer. And I think, you know, new off quarterback Connor Riley in Kansas State, I think they want to mold him in the way that he wants to be molded. Now, when it comes down to it, they're going to do what it takes to, to win a ball game. If there comes a game where, hey, Avery, we know you want to be a thrower, but if we're going to win this, you're going to have to be a runner. The, they'll make those choices. I, I think they want to stay out of that as much as possible, though. Yeah, and I, I think you the other thing that helps with the running situation for Avery Johnson is, and this, this is something we'll definitely talk about at some point this offseason, but you think about the wide receivers that he has right now. Uh, the 2022 team, they had, they had a good collection of reliable guys that could go do some things for you, and certainly it got stronger – halfway through the year when like Caden Warner became more than just like a reliable, Hey, he's going to catch the ball when you throw it to, him. he made some plays, but there, the opportunity is there for Avery Johnson to probably have the best wide receiver core since, I mean, I, I don't know how far back I would go on it, but maybe I could ask you, you've been here since 2017. I mean, 
Is this going to be the best set of wide receivers on the field since you've been covering K-State? It has the potential. I won't say that it's a lock. It has the potential. Um, even that first year, was the first year probably the best one? In yeah, seven? that that first year had like Byron Pringle was still here. Byron, so then uh, Pringle, Isaiah yeah, you would have also had Isaiah Zuber. So. I, I, and Isaiah Harris. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that that one probably with production and top end talent, but I think the collective effort here, and you're right, it's not it's not a certainty. It's something that it could be boom or bust, like we saw last year. Like we thought Keegan Johnson would have a pretty significant role last year. It was, it was a struggle early on. He started to maybe pick it up a little bit down the stretch, but Jace Brown came along, and th the hope would be that Dante Cephas is what a lot of people expected him to be when he transferred from Kent State to Penn State. So I think the opportunity is there, and that helps too. Just having a quarterback that number one, I mean, we we saw Avery Johnson. I I think he played a smarter game of quarterback in that Pop Tarts Bowl than maybe Will Howard ever did at K State because even Will Howard's good games. I mean, maybe the uh, you could probably say that the game against TCU or the game against Oklahoma State he was he was at his best in. T well, TCU the, there was some. The, are you talking about the Big 12 championship game? Yeah, well, yeah, there were – He had to rebound to kind of redeem himself there at one point. That yeah. one kind of got a little – I would say Oklahoma State and Baylor. The Baylor – Yeah. 31-3, yeah. that was a really good game. Yeah, so – but like we saw last year, a lot of turnovers came back in, probably about an interception a game for him. And I, I just think Avery Johnson has a little bit more to him there. So I think that helps too. And, and all that stuff makes the passing game better, which – it makes the running game emphasis a little bit lesser because I think you can do more throwing the football. And then also it's just going to make when you do run it all that much more potent because I think it does add a little bit more unpredictability to K-State. Although the predictable nature of their offense last year, I, I can remember uh, when Will Howard ran for the first down and then eventually the touchdown uh, against KU and Lawrence, I was thinking to myself like, he's absolutely going to keep the football here. Like, I, I don't know how, I don't know how KU does not understand that. So maybe the predictable nature of K-State isn't as uh, predictable to others, but I think that it's going to be something to, to keep in mind that the passing game is going to be better because of Avery Johnson and then also the receivers that he has. Thus, you probably won't have to have as many design runs and you're probably going to be able to keep a healthier Avery Johnson. Although I'll throw it to you on this. The one thing we haven't talked about, and this is a big part of quarterback health, is the offensive line, which you're breaking in a bunch of new players at. Um, we saw Avery Johnson be really smart about throwing the ball away against NC State. How replicable is that, and how important is the offensive line in keeping him healthy this year? I mean, if you're doing it in your first career start at quarter, quarterback, I would imagine that you, you just have that knack, you have that ability, you have that in your arsenal. So in terms of being replicable, man, if you could do, most quarterbacks can't do that until or know when to and when not to until their second year uh, at best. And he did it in his first career start. So in terms of replicating it, I'm not really concerned about that part. Uh, you know, you, you do have questions that need to be answered along the offensive line that, um, we're not going to have in February, right? So that's just going to be something that lingers out there in space until uh, we see the answer. Uh, do we see the answer in March and April and spring ball? You know, we'll see. We, we don't – it'll be interesting what the answers are because, you know, when we have media availabilities and talk to these guys, that's probably going to be our best indicator because it's not like, you know, we'll, we'll see 15 minutes of practice here, 15 minutes of practice there. There aren't really going to be the most revealing – to us to answer those types of questions. So, uh, and then you don't see anything really in fall camp either. So, you know, from just getting out and watching them standpoint, we probably don't have those answers till game one, game two. I mean, you probably need more than a couple games yeah. even. Um, it'll be interesting what they have to say. Look, as much as they're rebuilding that unit, unit, you do probably like that you are bringing back some guys that have a, a good chunk of playing time under their belt, whether it be, you know, Carver Willis, Taylor Portier, uh, Hadley Panzer. I, I think that's at least a good building block. Yeah, I, I would say to, to your point about getting answers, we will probably get the answers 
in, in spring ball or, you know, before the season starts, but we won't know if they're the right answers until early on there. Like the test won't be graded until, you know, maybe that first game at the end of August, but more likely than not, we're really not probably going to find much out until maybe the two lane game, but Arizona will probably be the first telling game of the year to, to let us know how the offensive line will fare. And look, I, I think they're going to get better. Like Connor Riley is, is praised by his players and the guys that have been here, they've been pretty solid. And so I think they'll get better as the season wears on. And it's just like anything too, guys are going to be seeing the field more than they ever have. And that's going to be something that, you know, you get better with more experience out there. So we'll see how that goes for K state final thing for you. I'll flash the quarterbacks up on the screen again. In that order that's up there, do you do you think that will be the depth chart this season, and and how important are the semantics of that? I do. Maybe Knut Semantic gets flipped, but I I, I mean I don't know that. Um, I would imagine they're on close to, or maybe I'm underestimating Jacob Knut a little bit, but close to equal footing. Uh, I imagine, though, at the end, QB2 is Jacob Knuth. I don't see a scenario where Barnett isn't QB4, so that looks right to me. In terms of semantics, probably doesn't matter because Barnett's going to redshirt and the other two already have. Yeah, so it'll be interesting. Do we think, is your prediction that they don't have to go to a backup quarterback this year because of injury, that if they do, it's because – they're up 45 to nothing with six minutes to play against UT Martin. Yeah. So you're asking a uh, backup quarterback due to injury. Yeah. Are you forced to play a backup quarterback this year? Not do you willingly well, at, do at least, at least a couple snaps. I would say so just because we are still talking about a runner and I think you would be more the exception than the, uh, with the group. If you stayed hundred percent healthy the whole year. Okay, maybe I'm stupid. I'm gonna say they don't have to do it, so we'll see. Yeah, but I, mean, I, 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 I honestly, you're if, if you're asking for realistic best case scenario, I think people should probably lean with like what you said, where it's yeah, maybe he misses a couple plays or like half a series because he's getting checked out a quarter. Yeah, yeah, uh, because it's it's weird, and, and people are like, oh, our quarterback always gets hurt, and and I get having that because it is your most important position, and you need to keep those guys healthy. Just look around, man. Guys, it's it's more rare than not for your quarterback to miss at least a little bit of time. Yeah, you, you look last season and, and everything, uh, it, it kind of similar to what we talked about in the NFL. We know Quinn Ewers missed time last year. Uh, we know that, uh, like some other guys throughout the league, John, John Rice Plumley was another one that missed time. TCU yeah. had to play multiple quarterbacks. Everybody at Tech. <laughs> Yeah, everybody at Tech, KU, um, and then you look around and you say, okay, these these guys didn't have to do it, but Dylan Gabriel did the season before. So it's like if you do go clean one year, you probably the year before or the year after are looking at something. So it is such a a random thing, and everybody is having to deal with it. So if you were healthy last year, you should probably be paranoid this year is what we're saying. So Alan Bowman's probably shaking in his boots a little bit. Well, especially given his history. That guy, he he probably he's sitting there thinking, I can't believe that I made it through this season. (laughs) Yeah, so Alan Bowman, who who did make it through? TCU had injuries, Texas had injuries. Uh, I mean, te- technically, Will Howard made it through last season, so your Buckeyes uh, better watch out. Houston, did Donovan Smith make it through? I don't know. Uh, he may have. But, Rocco Beck, I think, was right? clean at, at Iowa State, so you didn't have to worry about that. Um, and, and I don't think Donovan Smith's back anyway, right? So no, I don't think. I think no, he. I think he is. Uh, believe it or not, he was listed as a junior last year, which I can't believe. F- felt like he was at Tech for forever, but uh, I think he will be back at, at Houston. Or I, I don't know. I haven't kept well, up with that. Maybe he left. Maybe Roy Fritz said, I don't want you. West Virginia's, they were banged up last year. Um, BYU, Keaton Slovis is gone. UCF to bring KJ Jefferson. That'll be interesting. Yeah, yeah and that one's uh, that's that's getting a lot of love uh in a lot of places so it'll be interesting to to kind of see how it plays out in the big 12 it's important because well and utah's coming in cam rising as we know he didn't play at all last year it was like hey he's gonna play next week all right he's gonna play by week five he might come back you know down the stretch run and then he just never played and now i'm supposed to believe that he is going to play this year yeah and we got noah fafita in the league who could be the best quarterback him cam rising maybe avery i don't know um 
and then uh, Oshadour Sanders. There you go. But he was, yeah. he was. Uh, I don't know if he actually missed a game, but he looked like he should have. And and he did. Sp- and and that's one where it's like the offensive line uh, might put you in some some tough spots. Uh, I also think that they had some some ba- games that were so bad that he was done by like the second quarter, and they were just like rolling out uh, some like NAIA player that Dion can only get. So we'll see how it ends up going down, but it's important. I mean, you think about how it works out and then the depth behind it. And that's why like this could be a good season for K state, but it is imperative that Avery Johnson doesn't miss a ton of time because like we we've seen 2022 K state didn't have to miss a beat because they had quality depth behind Adrian Martinez. Even if we all laughed at it going into the 2022 season and then the same thing last year for KU. I'll use them as an example. I mean, if if they didn't have Jason Bean sticking around and, you know, Jalen Daniels is always getting hurt, then you're probably missing out on a nine-win season that they ended up with. So the quality of depth is important. You never want to have to use it, but if you get forced to that, it becomes a major deal. I agree. Um, and we'll see if KU has that now without Jason Bean. Yeah, it'll be interesting to follow. So that's a look at K-State's quarterback situation going into 2024. We will be back tomorrow with more content for you right here. Also, head over to kstateonline.com so you can get the full breakdown of K-State football and basketball, plus recruiting news always coming at you. Uh, At the end of the week, Drew and I will be hanging around. We'll have some recruiting news for you there as well. So for Derek Young, I'm Mason Both. Thanks for watching and listening to K-State Online.